I'm Bruce Simpson. I work in career services. I'm also an adjunct professor to teach professional development classes at Central. And I, so I do career counseling and I also do employer relations to help connect students and faculty with businesses and industries and organizations. And overall, my goal is to help you go from college to career. One of the best things you can do for an interview is to know plenty about the organization in advance. So for instance, at the uh, usually at the end of an interview, there'll be a part where they'll say, well, that's all the formal questions we have for you. Do you have any questions for us? And that's never a time where you want to say, no, thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. Why? And so that's a great time to ask about the company culture, to ask about anything that came up during the interview. and. Probably one of the best things you can do is ask an interesting question or something that shows that you care about the organization and that you have done your research. So in addition to going to their website and clicking on the about us or the mission statement or the company history, you could also put in that organization, that, that company, and then look at news how they've been in the news. Have they developed anything new? They have a new policy. What is it that have they had a good year? And what industry are they in? What's the trend for that industry? And maybe things look promising or maybe there's gonna be some issues coming down the road because of globalization or economic weaknesses. Who knows what it's gonna be? And you can also, what I like to say is, brag about yourself even in your questions. So. You might have seen something in the in the company culture, and you can ask about that. So you might say, "So I'm a I'm a very creative person, and I'm a, I'm really good at communicating, and I always want to see if I can go above and beyond." Is that something that your company values, right? And there's no best strengths to have. There's just your strengths. So whatever it is, or maybe you like to work independently and then come together on a team. Whatever it is, is your ideal work environment. Ask them if that would be, if you would be a good fit for that organization. So that's asking them a question, but it's also reminding them of your strengths. My interview work with students when we do interview practice, I don't necessarily start with, hey, here's question one. And I ask it and then the student responds and here's question two and three and four and five. And then at the end, give them feedback or that. I like to coach along the way. So a lot of times I'll interrupt students in a mock interview. For instance, if they use filler words like, you know, and the problem with filler words is they add nothing to your conversation. And at best, you could have someone interviewing you that doesn't really care. Like they use like, like, but they'll do that themselves. So maybe they're not real critical of you if you do it, or they don't notice that much. But you could have someone like me who's interviewing you. And after a while, I might start counting filler words and seeing that this maybe isn't the best applicant because we really value solid communication skills. And so you don't know who's going to be interviewing you. You don't know what they're going to care about. So you need to be as perfect as possible. So we work on filler words a lot. And the best part is you'll start to police yourself once you're aware of it. When I start interrupting you every time you say or like or essentially or basically, after a few minutes of that, you're going to start doing it on your own and you'll catch it. You'll say it, but then you'll catch it. And once you're conscious of it and you acknowledge it, you'll get better at it. And it really does take practice. So filler words are kind of fun to work on. And I don't like to make students feel really bad about it because it's, it's super common to do it. But as they evaporate from your speech and you become more professional, then that's just who you are. You don't use it. it. It really is something that you can take with you for life. One of the best things you can do is look at the actual job description. Read it closely and determine what it is that they put in there because they're definitely going to be looking for things that they list. So there could be other things that aren't listed in there that they're looking for. Those can be good to include in the interview, but that's going to be part of your general strengths. So if they are looking for organizational skills or if they're looking for technical skills, are you able to work with spreadsheets? Who knows what they're going to be asking for in there? You want to take inventory of your strengths and what experience you have and make sure that you mention that in an interview. 
because they may or may not ask you directly. Some of the questions are going to be general and some will be specific, but don't assume that everything that they're looking for, they're going to ask direct questions. So you need to be able to think about a lot of your replies and how you're going to weave in those strengths that relate to what's in the job description, the key tasks and the duties that you're going to do. So there are technical interviews for students that are majoring in computer science, oftentimes IT, physics, engineering, sometimes even accounting. There's going to be technical questions that they want to know if, if you know specific areas. Now that's going to be you understanding your the material that you learned over the course of your bachelor's degree, and you're going to have to apply that. And there are too many questions in too many different technical areas to really cover in a, in a general video like this. But what I will say is even in technical interviews, there will be aspects that are in common with what I call the rest of the interviews, the non-technical interviews. And that is there's really only a couple of things that they ask in regular interviews. And that is one, who are you? They really do want to understand who you are. And two, most importantly, what are you comfortably good at, right? There are things that you might be able to do because you've learned them, but they want to know what are you comfortably good at? Where are your strengths? What are some things that you've done on your own that demonstrate your strengths? In the interview, they want to see that. That relates to what you're passionate about. And the passion will push you through some of the harder aspects of a job. A lot of times you'll have to put in more work because a project requires it, or there were mistakes made, or there aren't enough people to help. Whatever it is, there's, in any organization, there's, you can think of it as an ocean with waves, and there's crests and there's troughs. And we should all perform well when we're riding the crest of something. That means we've got plenty of people to help, we have plenty of funding, so money's not an issue, the competition isn't killing us, and life is good. We've got work to do, and we have all the resources that we need. So everyone should excel when we're riding the crest. But then there's the troughs. That is, we're understaffed. Maybe we don't have the budget. Maybe the competition is taking away some of our work. Who knows what it is? But then the, the people that are really passionate about the work and they really care and they have a great work ethic, they're gonna push through that trough and get it done and then be able to ride the next crest. So that's what they're looking for. Not just who can do well when everything's lovely, but who can do it when times are tough because you have both in any organization. So what are you comfortably good at? What do you enjoy? And you will, you will find ways to discuss your strengths through storytelling. And storytelling, which I'm specifically using those words, is all about building trust. So if, if you think about human beings, we are storytellers. If you think about the best books you've ever read, the best movies you've ever seen, the most interesting people you've ever met, it's all about stories, right? And the stories are how we build trust. So there's three levels of human familiarity that we human beings have with each other. There's no like and trust. So I know you because we have this appointment and here we are talking, so I know you. The more we talk and the more I get to learn about you, like who are you, a big interview question, and what are you comfortably good at, then I start to like you. And I just like who you are as a person. I like how you communicate and I see the human side of you. And the more I like you and the more we talk, eventually we reach that third level of trust. And once I trust you, you're great. You are in. And it's not just that I, I trust that you're not going to lie, cheat, and steal. I'll be the, those will be given, I suppose. But it's more so that I trust that you're going to work hard when you need to learn the things that you don't know yet because you're a new hire in the organization, right? 
So you're going to work hard and you're going to get along with your colleagues and you're going to get along with customers. You're going to work well individually and you're going to work well on a team. I trust that you're going to do that. I trust that you're going to use good logic and judgment in your decision making. I trust that you're going to represent our organization well when you're out there doing the work. I trust, I trust, I trust. Trust is huge and the trust is built through storytelling. And the storytelling needs to include your strengths. Well, the strengths and weaknesses question is commonly brought up. Whether or not it's asked in an interview is another part of it, but people worry about, well, what about my weaknesses? To be honest, the interviewers care more about your strengths. They really don't care about your weaknesses. They know that the weakness question is awkward and un uncomfortable and everyone has weaknesses. Plus there are some, some kind of cliche or stereotypical answers to the weakness question. Some of them would be, I'm a workaholic, right? But that's a backhanded compliment, right? Because that means you have a tremendous work ethic, but I am a workaholic or I care too much, right? The one that you'd mentioned, perfectionism, that's not bad, but you it, it is a compliment to yourself as well that you do great work. So you might say that being a perfectionist means I might miss deadlines. So then you, I think the best way to answer any weakness question is to, you might do it by giving yourself a backhanded compliment through a weakness, but you can also say something that in the past I was more whatever. I was, I, I procrastinated a lot more in the past and I've since worked on it and I'm getting better, right? So you acknowledge a weakness, but you talk about how you're improving currently. So it's not going to be as much of a weakness. And that's a way to answer the question without going into something like, don't expect them to assume, oh, I am horrible at this and I will always be bad at this. And I am a real liability for your organization because of this. You're not going to do that. That's why sink yourself just to try to directly answer a question that really, like I said, they, they don't care that much about it, even though you think they would. They want to be impressed with your strengths. They want to hire good people. So they're not going to dwell on the weakness part. It might just be to see how you handle an awkward question. I would say that if you, if you don't have a, if you don't have a specific question that is what I would call good. In other words, when you leave the interview, you want them to say he or she did really well. Ask some really good questions, right? So I don't think I, I want to give any standard ones because if they're standard or common, they're not going to stand out. Probably ones that I would avoid are getting into money right away. If you start asking about what's in it for me or what are the pay and benefits questions, how much time off can I have? Can I work remote all the time or what? So you could ask some clarification questions instead of ask. So like if they say or don't say about the work environment and you would like to work somewhat remote or do hybrid, you might say it again, you need to say it in the form of a strength though. You might say, I really like coming into an office, but I can get a ton of work done at home. I'm very productive at home because I don't have any distractions and, or if it's in a city where you've got a, a commute that's a hassle. Whatever it is, you can talk about why you're gonna do great work from home. Not the fact that you want to work at home because you can goof off more, or you can do laundry when needed. What? Talk about why remote work is gonna be good for you. And on the, the pay part of it, you might ask instead of maybe on terms of promotions, say, I'm really passionate about this type of work. And is, it, is this an organization where I could be promoted within a year or two if I demonstrate that because I so something like that where you're talking about why you can benefit the organization and then ask will you be rewarded for that the dress question how should you dress the rule of thumb is dress as they dress and so you'll have to know in that organization how do they dress and so the rule is dress like them and or one step above. So you don't want to be one step below 
So if it's a really professional place and they are wearing business casual at a minimum and some people are dressed in business, so business would be for men, it'd be a suit, then you would want to dress business casual or business professional. If it is something that it is maybe an outdoor oriented organization and they dress in hiking pants and street hikers and flannel shirts or whatever, then you can dress a little dressier than that, but you don't have to wear a suit or something. So it is important to know how they are dressing. You can't go wrong by being dressed up, but I, I think there's maybe a point where you could show that you are what you are wearing is comfortable for that organization, and that's what you would like to wear at that or, at that organization. I would say never wear a hoodie, never wear anything that has got a logo on it. And by that, I mean, I have a shirt with a Wildcat logo, but that's because I work at a university. But dressing professional pants are a big thing. If you, if you have to wear jeans because you don't have anything else and you think it's an interview where jeans would be acceptable or it's a virtual interview, so you just wear a nice shirt. But if it's in person and you're gonna wear jeans, just make sure they're really nice and clean, no holes. Don't wear ratty shoes, wear nice shoes. So yeah, dressing up. And for ladies, women typically have a set of, or many sets of nice clothes. So they're probably gonna be, they're gonna be fine in terms of having something that is professional looking, but conservative and dressing one, one level above them is never a bad thing to do. If you need a haircut, get a haircut before your interview. And if you have facial hair, would be be well groomed. Doesn't mean you have to shave your beard, but you should have it groomed nicely. You don't want to you don't want to give them a reason to suspect anything other than you're a good solid professional. I would say there's three big things in terms of the nonverbals, and that is eye contact cannot be overrated. Right now, we're doing this virtually, and I'm doing something that's pretty difficult, and that is I'm staring right at the camera. In reality, I want to look here, because that's where you are on my screen. Now, if I use the mouse and cheat a little bit, I can drag the window, and I can make you there. I've put your face as close to the camera as possible. So right now, I'm looking at you, but I'm looking close to the camera. Right. And that's not always, maybe you can't do that, who knows. So then you gotta stare at the camera like I'm doing right now. And then it looks like I'm looking right at you. And that's the sense of connection. So eye contact is critical. In person or virtual, look at the people. And the other part is listening. A lot of times people get nervous about what they're gonna say next, and they're not listening to the question, or they're not listening to some of what the conversations are about that, because that can lead to a follow-up question that you might have. So a lot of times it's just calm down and not be nervous about what you're gonna say next or rehearsing what your words are in your head. Just listen, listen to what they say and treat it like a real conversation. And there's a third one. So eye contact, listening, oh, smiling. It, it helps. People want to hire friendly people. And so when you can remind yourself, if you're just not naturally a smiler, some people will put a post-it note on their monitor if it's a virtual interview. And they'll just say, smile, right? Because we like friendly people. And we think that they're gonna get along with our, with their coworkers and our, our whole team. So friendly people tend to get hired. Friendly smart people, right? Friendly smart people with strengths. So yeah, eye contact, listening, and smiling. You should only take notes on the things that you want to ask about, or if you are comparing organizations, maybe you're interviewing with several different companies, then you might want to compare some things, and those, these are notes that you can use afterwards. But I wouldn't take notes the way you would in class, because there's not going to be a test. They're not going to ask you what was covered. So you'd want to take notes on things that might be a follow-up question that you could ask, at either at the end, or if it's a conversational interview, things where they're saying something and you want to circle back to it later in a conversation type of setting, then doing that would be good. But don't feel the need to write down too much because that can also be distracting. And if you're writing more notes about something and you're missing what they're 
saying or what they're asking. You don't want to say, oh, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? I was taking notes. So I wouldn't say don't take excessive notes. It's good to show that you are taking notes maybe, depending on the interview, but don't overdo it. Well, the way I do my mock interviews and the different career counselors have a little bit different take on it. So we're not gonna be exactly the same. We are gonna have our personalities that come out in our mock interviews. But my style is that I'm definitely gonna work on filler words. So being aware of that, if you wanna practice, that's fine, but it's okay. Cause it's a coaching session, not just, you're not just being graded and then you leave. You're gonna be able to practice some of these things. And then I'm always gonna ask about your strengths. So when people schedule appointments with me, the auto email reply actually includes a somewhat lengthy thing that says, if you're gonna work on resumes or cover letters, then please send me a draft in advance. If you wanna work on your mock interview skills, then be thinking about three of your biggest strengths because I'm gonna ask you about that and we're gonna tell stories based on your strengths. So for me, those are the ones that you can work on in advance. But even if you don't, we'll still cover it during it. It'll just take some time front because I get to know you. And so once I get to know you, then we start in with your storytelling, which you can use in almost any interview setting. Anything that is a good story that talks about you actually doing something in your past that you did well, you enjoyed, and you were good at, you're proud of it, it's going to be valuable material for you to talk about. Well, it's pretty common after an interview to send a thank you. It could be a thank you note. It could be a thank you email. Email is pretty common now. And, and there's, after the interview, it's really, it's outside of your control other than thanking them for it. And if you don't hear anything in a while, that's the unfortunate part is organizations aren't required to tell you if you were selected or not. If you like, so for an interview, a lot of times they can do a virtual interview first, and then you could be selected for an in-person interview, but they may not tell you, you just don't hear anything. Now, the better companies, the better organizations will say, thank you for your interest. And unfortunately, you're not moving on to the next round type of thing. Please keep us in mind. You know, they'll just send you a short email saying, thanks, but you didn't make the cut. And then you know, and you can press on with other organizations that you want to try to interview for. And then the ones that are gonna bring you on, then they'll tell you, hey, congratulations. We'd like to schedule you to come here in person or whatever it's gonna be. Or, you know, we're offering you the job, whatever that next step is. But if you haven't heard, if it's an organization you really are interested in, and maybe you think you might get an offer from another company, and you don't want to take that. If you you can you can reach out to an organization and say I've I've interviewed at multiple organizations. Yours really interests me the most. Are you close to making a decision on hiring or the next stage of interviews? Thank you for your time. Just wanted to stay in touch. All right. So just a basic thing about how you're really interested in working there. But there's only so much you can do after the interview. Like they know who you are. So then they know how to reach you because that's in your resume and they'll, they'll reach out if they want to. Probably recapping something that I mentioned earlier, and that is what are your compelling stories about your strengths? And the more compelling the storyteller, the more likely that person is to getting the job, especially if all things, all other things are equal, the best storytellers. And I don't mean make up tales, right? These are, these should be good, positive, genuine stories about you that relate to your strengths. That is who will typically get hired because if they didn't care about the stories, they would just go off the resume. They wouldn't interview. They'd say, we assume all these resumes are accurate. So this person looks like the most qualified, but we don't tend to do that. We as human beings, we want to interview. We want to look that person in the eye and get to know them because it's still a gamble. Even someone who interviews well, they may not, they may not work out. And six months later, they either get fired or they leave the organization because it's not a good fit. So there's no guarantee that even from a good interview, that that candidate is gonna just be an awesome employee. So it's a gamble, but they're trying to minimize the risks and have the best chance possible to hire a really good employee. So have good stories so they can really know who you are. And if you don't have good stories, your answers will be pretty short a lot of times, and you just won't be viewed as a really compelling applicant. 
So we will work on storytelling and the mock interviews that I do with students. So I hope that helps you understand more about mock interviewing and to reach me or any of the career counselors that are in our office, you can use the link that's in the description below and you can schedule an appointment, which are typically an hour long, and we can work on interviews, resumes, all those things together. And you can schedule more than one meeting. A lot of times the first time we meet, it's, oh, that was great. We need to work on some things. Can I schedule another appointment? Absolutely. We are here to help you. And the best part is we are open year round even during the winter break, even during summer, and even after you graduate, we help alumni with career services for life. Well, I hope that helps. It was great to be able to cover the basics on mock interviewing, and I hope you all learned something. I look forward to maybe meeting with you in the future.